Hi guys and welcome back to this week's episode of Let's Chat Ethics. I'm your co-host Oriana. And I'm your other co-host Amanda. And this week we're going to be discussing a bit about ethics, how we define that and who gets to define ethics. We'll also be looking at the algorithmic colonisation of Africa by Abiba Berhain. And so one of my favourite kind of quotes from the blog slash article that she wrote was insisting on one single framework for various ethical, social and economic issues that arise in various contexts and cultures with the integration of AI is not only unattainable, but also advocating a one size fits all style dictatorship and not a guideline. So Amanda, what are your thoughts on that? So I think this was also one of my favorite quotes or at least the one I've found most um, intriguing is not the word I'm looking for, but <laughs> um, yeah, about the article because one of my big complaints about all the different guidelines that different countries and organizations have put out is that they're always guidelines and they're kind of ambiguous and also the fact that we have so many, it means that it's it's hard to pick and choose. But at the same time, it's true that um, what's going to be the best option is going to depend based on um, not only the country and what, or like the country or the culture and what that culture or country might consider a more ethical or a more important value, but also even the the application or like the domain that it's um, uh, kind of like that, that we're looking at specifically. So I think um, a good example of where having guidelines um, rather than a strict rule or where it, where it shows that there's value in, in the flexibility has been in the whole digital contact tracing uh, debate that we had, right? So specifically in, in the UK where Oriana and I are based, um, the NHS actually, um, I think originally thought about using Google's and Apple's um, built-in decentralized um, system and then opted for actually a centralized system. And what was very interesting about that is that they actually published an article kind of going over the pros and cons of each um um, each implementation and actually argued why they had chosen to go with a, a centralized system, even if um, it might be a little bit less <laughs> less good in terms of the, the privacy, but it might have other, um, other pros. Uh, so I thought that was a very interesting, yeah, an interesting example for for using guidelines because maybe if as a rule you always have to prioritize um privacy then you might have the problem that um in a case like this where it's again not black and white which tends to be the case with a lot of ethical conundrums right it's not um always really clear cut that something is absolutely unethical then um yeah i thought this was a really good example so i don't know Ariana, do you have any thoughts yeah yeah i think with the um with the digital contact tracing, I think it that is a good example because um, I think that was something that the UK was, I don't know, held, like a lot of criticism was put on the UK government for using a centralised server because I guess anyone who doesn't know the difference between the centralised and the decentralised, centralised is where all data will be held in one centre point, whereas decentralised it's um, in different different like share points and it's more down to the individual user so data would be on the phone and you could kind of opt in and opt out so essentially argue to give you the user more like autonomy over their data um so yeah I think that was interesting to me because I felt like I mean the DCT um debacle has <laughs> has kind of caused a lot of uh I mean the UK government spent an unnecessary amount on on digital contact tracing it hasn't been yet successful but I do think your point of them though I will the NHS any anyway publishing why they chose to go down that route was a good way of actually kind of letting people hold them to account and being transparent which I think is what those guidelines are about and I think yeah when um Aviva talks about that in her 
ask why do you think this whole like one mold fits all wouldn't work do you know what I mean like in with the <laughs> European guidelines for trustworthy AI obviously that's a European guideline and I do think it's good to have um, localized guidelines that go and fit in with like the culture and the way of life but then I do think which we've discussed before we need to come up with kind of a universal one because like social media is universal a lot of tech and AI that we're using is going to be universal and it will be implemented in all continents so how do we as a world come to a kind of consensus about how we make sure we're right, right on track to like safe technology but I also like the fact she mentions that um that Africa shouldn't as a continent just adopt like western tech and a western like values in tech and that they should be able to shape their own and define their own without having the influence of like the west like telling them how it should be and what, like which guidelines to take and which not to use and how to use data etc and kind of like <clears throat> blindly like just accept things that the west is telling me yeah absolutely i think um one of the things we should consider is um how can we reach um a universal kind of agreement right because i think social media is going to keep expanding right like if we think that um i think youtube and facebook each have like two billion users for example um then, I mean, inevitably, a significant number of those are going to be in um, maybe not China because Facebook is banned there, but, you know, across Europe, the US, other Asian countries and Africa. Um, so we need a way to to offer guidelines that are universal to them. And I think like a good kind of approximation of where we can the, the fact that we are able to reach this sort of, sort of consensus would be through the uh, the Declaration of, of Human Rights, right? I think that's um, as close as we have to a kind of universal um, universal idea of, of ethics. Um, so I think it, it will be feasible that we will get to um, something a little bit more, um, yeah, universal <laughs> than... than currently what we have which are kind of individual countries or groupings of countries um especially because i think you know yeah there's so many countries that right now are um in a way uh, fighting for for the influence in in africa i know that um china and europe etc you know all investing uh, money in african development and it's sort of a colonization 2.0 and i can imagine that ai and bringing in the ai market to africa is going to have a big um impact in this yeah yeah that's actually something that um avana bartolesi the book i mentioned last week that we were discussing an artificial revolution mentions about how um like nigeria's tech scene is like booming like like really booming but when you actually look look at who like who these tech companies are, even though they're under the like demise of being like Nigerian, um, when you get to the like board level, it's I, I think I, rem- I can't remember what company she was saying, but it was like all French white men, and then actually then when you scoped it back, the company had been bought by a, like a company in France had bought them out, but they were unlike operating in Nigeria and like kind of un giving off the impression that they're a completely Nigerian run company. So I think it's stuff like that, I guess as well is um, like, a, yeah, like the colonization, like 2.0, like you were saying, where it's like kind of using technology as another way to kind of take resources um, from like from different Af- African countries. So I think it's really, yeah, I think there was another quote from uh, the article that I also like was the dis- the discourse of mining people for data is reminiscent of the colonizer attitude that declares humans as raw material free for the taking. So I think that was another um, like quote that I thought was like really interesting and like really, really powerful actually. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely powerful. It's definitely the, the word for that quote. We are already seeing like data being, yeah, data is like now argued to be the most 
valuable like resource on earth and I think yeah it's a, it's a, it's a new oil right <laughs> yeah literally the new oil so I think it's it's yeah I guess it's worrying how I guess again different like cultures will perceive privacy and data and I think when you get down to those guidelines like I know in in certain cultures they're more willing to give away like data like freely um and don't mm-hmm. see it as a privacy issue whereas certain cultures will be more way more reserved about giving away um certain data and I think again like like you see in China China is like people are quite free with their with their data and it's quite freely being used there aren't as many um, protections so I just wonder like would it be possible to get to a universal like ethical guideline um where we could all where like as a as a world we could all agree on like a certain level of accountability like a certain level of like transparency a certain level of like bias like protection all these kind of things mm-hmm. yeah I mean I think um privacy is definitely one that stands out as being very much um a western sort of like European and American value um I was at a panel not like last year but a year ago and somebody else on the panel mentioned that in Japanese they don't even have a word for privacy or, or that actually the word for privacy in Japanese is privacy um and I think that's very interesting and um especially because it's something that we value so much in the U- in 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 Europe and and in the US um and there's definitely a trade off right so we need to give out a certain amount of our data in order to get the the benefits of artificial intelligence um, that that we're seeing today, right? All our um, social media, etc. Um, even down to kind of uh, banal things like getting the right Netflix recommendations or um, things like that, you know. But um, in order to improve, I don't know, roadworks and all of that, that all requires for people to give out some amount of data. Um, so it will be interesting to see where the balance is. Um, so the amount of privacy that, that we need. And especially once we reach, right? So for example, there is, I think, more Chinese um, Chinese produced apps uh, like TikTok and stuff, right? That are coming to... Europe and the West, I guess, and presumably, you know, if if uh, privacy is not something that is all that valued somewhere like China, then what does that mean um, in terms of of our use of those apps? Um, and for that, I think it's important that we have uh, more universal guidelines, or certainly more transparency about what is happening with with that data um i don't know if i'm i'm not sure what the different countries positions is on on transparency and how transparent they need to be um i don't know if you have any input but i i also don't know what the sort of i guess the maybe the african perspective is on on privacy and how important that is um so that would also be something interesting uh, maybe we can ask alfie the, the chat what we talked about in our first episode <laughs> Yeah, I think that's, um, I guess that's what uh, ethics looks at a lot. Like when you look at like philosophy as well, we're looking at kind of like what kind of trade-offs do you make? I guess there's in every, in every kind of like ethical decision-making that has to be some kind of, unfortunately, some kind of like trade-off or where you hope whatever decision you're making's like got the most, causing the most, least amount of harm and like the most amount of good, I say. Um so yeah, will it get to a point where it's like as long as people are being like, "Hey, we're taking like loads of data from you, we're being completely transparent about it," um, would, will that mean that people are more willing to be like, "Oh, why not? Yeah, sure, I'll give like a bit more data." Which I do think, in a way, when you think about it with digital contact tracing, I do think that has been the case, a, like a lot more so because if you'd said before the pandemic hit that people will be giving like the second you get off an airplane like if you leave the country you're giving like your address like where you've been who you're going to be in contact with every time you enter a restaurant you're putting down your name your number like which in a way like isn't completely protected you're putting down a piece of paper and anyone can see your name and number so all these things that before people would be like 
I know the average person would probably be like, absolutely not. But then if it's in the name of like collective public health, I think that's the kind of like ethical like trade-off that you're thinking, okay, well, I'm happy to, or most people are probably happy to be like, okay, if this can potentially actually save lives, then I'm happy to forfeit some of my privacy. I think those are the kinds of, I guess, like decision-making routes that ethics and those ethical guidelines lead people down. It's like trying to, and I think that's what also like ethics in tech is like overall is trying to do, is trying to get people to make, before they get to the point of just like creating something, it's thinking about these decisions from the get, which I guess has been argued to now not be the case, (laughs) where it's just stuff being created, not necessarily with the intent of ever causing harm, it's just like maybe, wow, we're creating, we're creating, but not actually necessarily thinking of the end goal. But I think we all need to think of the end goal, whether that's in like whatever, like whatever we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, one thing that comes to mind for me every time uh, we talk about um, the a sort of like misled um advancements in technology right so scientists or computer scientists building things that then end up going a little bit wrong i always think of the the mad scientist <laughs> but i mean i would say that's something that definitely happens i mean i don't think any the majority of of systems i don't think have been built with ill will right i do remember i think at some point um there was a system to detect a particular Chinese minority, and I th- always think that's ultimately very questionable. Like, what would be a good use case for this? Um, or same, I mean, a couple of years ago, there was a, that app doing the not an app. Um, somebody trained the system to detect uh, gay men th- from from their pictures, um, and yeah, but those things, I always think what could possibly be the good application. But I think these sorts of examples are the exception and not the rule when it comes to questionable AI. I think more likely is things like, oh, well, we we wanted to to make something more efficient. It just so happened that we trained it on racist data or um, there's the example of that app for reporting uh, holes in the wall, um, not in the wall, uh, on roads that... Uh, then ended up meaning that since it was richer neighborhoods where people would have more smartphones available, then um, mainly holes in the road would be fixed in richer neighborhoods, right? Um, but these are more, they're not intentional consequences of the, the use. I mean, I think um, an app that allows holes in the road to be fixed as soon as possible is, is a good idea in principle. Um, but I think fundamentally from... Uh, the education in in tech uh, we are missing a component of critical thinking and uh, not critical thinking but sort of evaluating every aspect of, of the task and I think especially um you know tech has uh, infamously uh, a problem with diversity and these are problems that would be spotted with more diversity but uh, we don't have that so yeah, no, I completely agree. I think that's a massive problem. I guess technology, I think that's the thing. A lot of people blame tech or blame AI, but it's like, no, you have to think it. AI and tech are only kind of just like shadowing societal problems. So like, do you know what I mean? Like with facial recognition and all these things that have been like deemed as racist, it's just it's just mirror, mirroring an already, the problem that already exists in society. So it's like, yeah. yeah, I think with with when it comes to that, it's like diversity is massively needed in all of all of all of the all of the tech companies. Anyone in anyone who's like programming or like anything to do with AI, like even in like philosophy as well and ethics, there needs there needs to be more diversity in in all in all areas. So otherwise, like these problems would just wouldn't take place to begin with. Yeah, because I think actually also philosophy has famously a problem with uh, it also being a bunch of white guys. (laughs) 
Yeah. Um. All the famous philosophers, it's like Kant, Heidegger, you know, it's like all the, it's like Nietzsche, everyone's like an old white guy. So, yeah, and I think um, this is something we've, we've talked about before. Yeah, definitely tech needs more diversity, but not just in terms of um, socioeconomic background, I guess, but also um, more diverse in terms of uh, an educational and professional background, right? So I think we need more interdisciplinary teams. Um, and I think this is where we can see that um, people who do arts and social sciences are um, definitely very valuable to the, the technology that we're developing. Agreed. So yeah, I was actually on a panel with the creative director, Veta Sampson from Microsoft recently. And one of the things she said that really stood out to me was she was like, um, we need, yeah, we need more diversity in the, the stance of we can't just have everyone in these companies who's come from like MIT, Harvard, Stanford. And it's like, it's very much the Ivy League universities who are represented then in the big tech companies. And she was just saying like how uh, the majority who tend to go to these universities obviously come from a way more privileged um, background in terms of money. And she was like how a lot of these people can't relate to someone who's like, she was like grew up in, she was like the South side of Chicago where there's a lot of poverty and they're the ones who are being policed. So she was like, it's not just down to um, like race and gender, but also down to like economic status as well. And like these, she was basically saying that big tech companies need to take in people from like, you know, like not just the Ivy League and not necessarily even that you had to go to university, like public colleges, like do you know, like coding schools that cost less money. I think it's like really actually, and that really stood out to me because I thought that's really, really important because otherwise we're just never going to get the full branch of like actual diversity yeah and i think that's also it, again it extends to to philosophy because I, I get the feeling that it's the, the same sort of thing and i think even um abiru mentioned in her article that these are the universities that are st- starting to have um actually specifically ai ethics courses um which scarily are still really rare in computer science degrees. I know that I certainly didn't have one um, during my degree. Um, and in fact, <laughs> at some point I proposed to my supervisor that we start, um, if not a course, but uh, maybe at least some, some kind of seminars or a seminar series uh, on AI ethics. And the university said, oh, you already did that. And I was like, I did. <laughs> and, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, having attended what they thought was an AI ethics. The problem, I think, is partly that the, the area is so broad that not all AI ethics is relevant to all AI practitioners or um, technologists. But, you know, I think, um, yeah, we need to to bring more education and more people from more diverse, diverse backgrounds because it's, uh, it's quite a problem right now. And I think especially... If we're talking about coming up with uh, global guidelines, then all the more reason to have as many stakeholders as diverse as possible um, involved. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like even when you just see that the lot like Google and all these companies and they put out their ethical AI like guidelines, it just seemed a bit ironic to me because <laughs> I was thinking it just to me felt like a bit of a marketing campaign to just shut people up and to get people off their back which is I think essentially well actually I had I guess a bit of a reverse effects actually but I think they thought it was going to just make people be like oh yeah they're ethical now sweet they can just carry on (laughs) but yeah I think it's going to be really important like you said making sure that all stakeholders like worldwide is we have to have more represent representation and especially like as Abiba was saying like Africa as a continent also needs to be in the conversation as well it's not it can't just be constantly um yeah just talking about America and Europe and then occasionally China as well it's just kind of these three way like kind of mismatch that isn't giving full representation at all to what ethical guidelines could mean because I don't think you can really have ethical if you're missing out like whole continents. So there's also not thinking about like South America as well and Asia. (laughs) 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, especially when you think that like um, Africa is almost like twice the population of um, Europe. That's insane that we're not even really um, talking about them. Yeah, we talk about the the US, China and, and Europe when we're talking about AI ethics and defining what, what is ethical. Yeah, and I think in terms as well in leaving out a whole tech scene as well, it's like, as like Abiba pointed out in her article that um, I think the ending was basically saying that Africa should be able to shape their own like identity and this like previous identity is that it's like impoverished and like needs the help of the West when actually they've got a booming tech scene in like multiple countries. Um, and that I think was, that like stood out to me because I was like, yeah, this shouldn't be, shouldn't be this like image of Africa needing the West to be able to prosper when actually it doesn't at all. If anything, so far, West has done nothing but hold Africa back. Indeed. And I think on that note, we're actually up on our time for this week. So thank you very much for listening. And thank you very much for tuning in, guys. Um, as always, if you want to follow us on social media on Twitter, we're Let's Chat Ethics. And we're actually going to be delving a bit further into um, AI ethics principles and the guidelines since this is a subject we could talk about for hours and there are enough guidelines worldwide that we actually will be delving into each of them for the next couple of weeks so tune in for that so thanks thank you